I started to get arrested at a young age. As soon as I turned 18, like the week after, I got arrested for the first time and taken to jail. So I cycled in and out of county jails and it was for things like public intoxication. It was never large. I lived in a small town and an easy arrest was to go find Amanda. Hi, Amanda. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me today. Can you please introduce yourself and a little bit about what brings you here today talking to me? Yeah, and thank you so much for having me. Um, so, yeah, my name is Amanda Hall. I live out in Kentucky, eastern Kentucky to be specific. Um, my occupation, I work for an organization called Dream.org. I work on criminal justice reform, which is a very personal issue for me, a passion for me. Uh, so as I mentioned, I live out in Kentucky, um, out in Appalachia. So, yeah. you know, it's a pretty, it's a pretty poor community. So I dealt with poverty, um, you know, basically the whole time I was growing up and my mother, uh, who was amazing, um, but was a single mom trying to take care of me, had suffered a lot of trauma. Um, she was a survivor of domestic violence and mm -hmm. had turned to substances to, you know, self-medicate. Um, because back then, you know, dealing with your trauma or counseling therapy, that just wasn't something that was ever talked about in my community. So, unfortunately, uh, due to my mother's issues, um, I got to know a lot about the criminal legal system pretty early on. Um, she was arrested. I began, you know, staying with family members or wherever I could stay. Um, and, you know, it was heartbreaking because she was, she was my mom. And soon... After in my early teens, that's when, you know, it's really popular, like right now, shows like Dope Sick on Hulu, uh, you know, Painkiller on Netflix, but I lived, you know, really like ground zero of where the opioid epidemic um, really just flooded our community. So around that time, I was in my early teens, um, I began to experiment with drugs and alcohol. Um, and at 16, I was given a legal prescription from a doctor. And really, uh, that's when my substance use disorder really kicked off. Um, okay. Can I ask you about yeah. that a little bit? Like I know, specifically, the medical system is similar in Canada, but not exactly the same. How did you get access to the prescription and like what was it for and prescriptions or access to these i guess narcotic slash i don't know addictive drugs like prescription drugs in canada is not as easy as it is in the states as i understand although that may or may not be true how, how did you get the prescription and did did it was it you being a young person sort of coming up with some story to get the prescription was it because you had some sort of illness or need for it like how did that yeah happen? so and, i had been in a car accident sort of to you? um i didn't have you know majorly get hurt um but i had went to the doctor after the yeah. accident and that was when i was prescribed did you say you got into an accident yeah i was in a okay. car accident oh shit um, okay yeah, with just mild injuries. Yeah. But whenever I went to the doctor to get checked out, of course, I was sore. Um, you know, I was prescribed um, opioids uh, by a doctor. So, right. yeah, after that point, uh, like I mentioned, I'd already experimented with drugs and alcohol, especially like marijuana, drinking, um, but opioids really, you know, were just it took all like my worry away you know mm -hmm. most of my life I really worried about my mom 
you know, I had a lot of trauma from being removed and, and going to these different places and, you know, out of poverty too. Um, you know, we were, we didn't have much. I always had insecurity of if the lights were going to get turned off or the water. Um, so when I, you know, did drugs and alcohol and particularly opiates, you know, all of that like went away. Um, yeah. I could kind of like breathe. Mm -hmm. I think that it's very difficult for people who don't have experience with substance abuse to understand how, why it's so addictive, I guess, or, or to understand that sense of, at least I know for myself, when I think back the first time, at least I found the right drug, <laughs> it felt as if God reached out of the sky and sort of handed me the, the ticket to life. Like here you've arrived, you know, you can feel okay finally. And I think that's what you're sort of describing. Yeah, absolutely. And it, and it felt that way for a mm -hmm. while, you know, it was like my best friend where I would, I would turn to, um, and then, you know, eventually it became something that I had to have to, um, you know, function. I started to get arrested at a young age. Um, the first time I got picked up by the police, I was still in high school and they took me to school, which was, um, you know, amazing. I didn't go to enter the system at that point. Um, but the, as soon as I turned 18, like the week after, um, I got arrested for the first time and taken to jail. Um, so I cycled in and out of county jails for years from the time I was 18 to my mid twenties. Um, I would be in there for weeks or a month here or there, or, you know, just constantly. And it was for things like public intoxication. It was never right. large. I lived in a small town and an easy arrest was to go find Amanda because I was going to be intoxicated somewhere, you know, like I right. um, use drugs consistently. Um, so, and during that too, I remember, you know, when I realized that I had to have this and that I actually wanted to quit um, and I couldn't mm. and like that realization I think was kind of like a turning point. Like this is more than what I'd bargained for, like more than I thought that this was going to be. Um, when was and, that or how did you get to that point? Yeah, I would say it was, I mean, probably 18, 19, like when I okay. full force, yeah. like really had wanted to quit and realized I couldn't because before then, you know, I was so young. It was um, even going to jail a couple of times. I was like, this is fine. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, but then I kind of, you know, I wanted to go to college like I wanted to do. Um, and I really, you know, could not stop um, using. Yeah. So I had tried. I was like, okay, I can't do this on my own. So what? you know, are the options. And unfortunately where I live, there were none. There were no like treatment centers. There was no nothing. You know, the way that we treated folks during that time was incarceration. Um, mm -hmm. I think that's something too, that maybe in those, uh, they describe it a little bit in those TV shows, but really that was the answer for right. everyone. Like our incarceration rates, grew, you know, our overdose deaths grew, you know, they were building new prisons everywhere. They weren't building at the time rehabilitation centers or counseling centers. That's not what, um, right. what was happening. Uh, I wanted to ask you about how, I guess, sort of, I don't know if it's a Southern thing. I, I mean, it is an American thing as I understand it, sort of the religious moralizing of all this stuff and that harsh perspective of mental health and addictions does did that or does that still impact how you were treated and i guess that's probably a big barrier to a lot of the work you're doing today yeah um substance use uh, disorder unfortunately 
you know, there's still so much stigma um, around it and lack of education. I mean, still to this day, uh, you know, we look back on those times and, and building all those jails and prisons and in, incarcerating people and drug overdoses rising. Uh, I see it again right now um, mm -hmm. when it comes to, you know, fitting on instead of, you know, uh, increasing access to harm reduction. We are again having harsher laws. Um, so, yeah, it was I remember when I was trying to stop and even talking to some of my family members who, you know, loved me, they would just tell me, just stop. Like, why are you like this? Like, why won't you? Um, you need to, you know, and me like saying, you know, saying I want to, <laughs> right, yeah. I cannot do it and just not, um, just not being understood. And, Every time I would go back to the jail, you know, even the correctional officers, like, here you are again. Like, when are you going to learn your lesson? Mm -hmm. And it, mm -hmm. it wasn't that, you know, I like my mental health struggles and I'm, you know, also co-occurring. I have some other mental health issues that were not addressed. Um, so, yeah, that was a real huge stigma. And I think one of the reasons we had so many jails and didn't even have a psychiatric facility was because people were bad and they needed to be punished and that, that's just how it was yeah yeah has it changed much it has changed um but we're not nearly you know we're we're not where we where we should be right. um i see often us take a step forward and then you know taking two or three steps back, if that makes any sense. Yeah, yeah, it does. It does. How, I'm curious how you, when you were describing literally the, it was jail or the street, I guess, kind of thing. I guess I was just kind of curious uh, if there was AA or NA or any 12-step groups around in your area at the time. And even if so, when I work with people in smaller communities, it's very hard to find a 12 step meeting. And even when you do find one, oftentimes the recovery there or the people there perhaps aren't the best sources of help. So I'm just kind of curious if that was even available to you at the time. Yeah. Um, I remember in my mid twenties, uh, that's when I finally ended up going to prison. Um, mm -hmm. but right before that, there started to be some, 12 step meetings, um, in our community, because that's around the time to, uh, you know, we had started, they'd started a drug court program. Like it was very new. Um, so those 12 step meetings, there was all, often, you know, people that were in drug court or the counselors. So I was always paranoid. Like, I know it's supposed to be anonymous, but there are people connected to right, the court right, system right. here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I cannot, you know, the court system doesn't like me at this point. Um, and also in, in that rural community, um, you know, there wasn't transportation. We don't have, you know, buses. Um, you know, growing up, I, we would have to walk a mile to the store and back and right, carry our right. groceries because there's right. no kind of transportation. So getting to meetings that way um, was was really hard too. So yeah, there wasn't, there was church and, um, and jail. So far we sort of covered how, you said you're from Appalachia. That's how I say it, right? Appalachia? Appalachia. Appalachia. Thank you. you I've go. seen, you I saw, and I assume you get this often, maybe not. I saw the J.D. Vance story on Netflix, which I thought was amazing. I thought it was really well done. Um, do you, can you, maybe you can just comment on that a little bit. Was it, I assume it was dramatized and whatever else, but do you think it did a good job at depicting a lot of what people from Appalachia experience? Yeah. I thought the movie, um, done a better job than the book did. Um, mm -hmm. Honestly, I had a lot of issues with the book and the way that folks uh, 
who uh, were experiencing poverty, how they were portrayed uh, right. in, in that, you know, um, I live in a, I live in a community that is beautiful. Appalachia is gorgeous. And this community also has been exploited in ways that are, that are really hard to, to wrap my brain around, right, um, right. you know, from coal companies, um, coming in and, you know, tearing off the tops of our mountains, right. um, you know, with folks in our community dying at a young age because of things like black lung and the accidents and the coal mines. Um, and then, you know, them leaving out and not like paying their share of taxes yeah. or coal severance. Uh, and then I look at, you know, the opioid epidemic and, just how that flourished here and until it it got out of these small rural poor communities uh like when it started spreading more that's mm -hmm. when there started to be more rehabilitation centers and all of that but like i said here everyone was just incarcerated and that is still you can still feel that uh kentucky is number one in the nation for kids who are being raised by someone other than their parents, you know, there wow. are wow. so many wow. kids being raised by grandparents because of incarceration. Um, so yeah, the, so the way that folks from this community was portrayed in the book, which like I said, the movie was better. Uh, yeah. I'm not a fan. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I unfortunately have not read the book. Okay. Um, do you think at least that that did that, I mean, I don't want to get too much into that book and movie, but there clearly is a, or has been, as you just described, it's almost as if sort of middle America or Southern America, I guess middle America is more accurate here, just shoved underneath the carpet, so to speak, and left to suffer in a, in a way. And that story often gets left out of kind of the narrative, I think, about healing all these problems. I'm not sure if it is. I'm an outsider, so to speak, from Canada. But um, how do you see that conversation unfolding in your advocacy work? Yeah. Um, and I think, uh, I think you were completely right with what you just said. Um, you know, a lot of these rural communities are left out of conversations and have been left out of, out of conversations. Um, and I feel like folks are starting uh, to talk more, especially about drug use and mental health um, mm -hmm. and starting to demand better. Um, and you know, and really are able to now be educated um, on what's going on and, and issues with mental health and, and lack of resources. Uh, but I still see often them used as kind of pawns, mm -hmm. especially in politics mm -hmm. um, or, you know, politicians coming in, you know, maybe once in a, a year and swearing that they're going to help the community. <laughs> They're going right. to bring jobs. They're going to, you know, and yeah. then you never see them again. And people are so desperate that a lot of people fall for that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as soon as that person gets elected in office, that doesn't happen. You know, the, the county that I'm from, that's where Lyndon B. Johnson famously started the war on poverty. And it's still one of the most impoverished counties in the United States of America. So folks out here, and you can also see it with like decline in, in voters because they, a lot of folks too, you know, have, have just no trust or belief. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah. 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 And, and in some sense, <laughs> that's a total rational, um, perspective to have. Why, why vote? These people don't help us. I think bringing it sort of to this idea of poverty, addiction, mental illness, or mental health problems, 
that whole umbrella. How do you, we see this thing happening in Canada a lot more and clearly in, at least again, from an outside perspective in San Francisco, Los Angeles, the, the mix of mental illness and substance abuse. And we, again, I'm, I'm just going to speak sort of from my understanding of a Canadian perspective, but I think it's similar in the U.S. The deinstitutionalization of mental illness hospitals to up until today, it seems as though the pendulum has swung way too far the other way. I guess it's not like that in Kentucky, where here we basically are decriminalizing possession. And so people are getting high on the streets and all kinds of things. And that's not good either. And I, I wonder, I guess I'm curious about what, where you see that whole process unfolding and what you think might be a, the best approach or an approach that is worth pursuing now. Yeah. And does that make sense? That question? Yeah. Yeah. yeah that, I mean, that makes a lot of sense. You know, here in Kentucky, in particular, uh -huh. this state, you know, we incarcerate um, so many folks for, you know, um, things like drug possession, for public intoxication, for everything. So, unfortunately, jails and prisons are still the biggest providers, like, of mental health services, which within there, which in there, within those facilities, there's little to none. Right, um, right. <laughs> it's interesting because across the state, we had um, this summer, my colleague and I, across the state of K Kentucky, we had these events called Public Health is Public Safety. So it was events with us, you know, folks who have experienced, um, drug use or substance use disorder. It was with some law enforcement, um, some faith leaders, you know, because Kentucky is very big on, yeah. <laughs> you know. And um, also there was business leaders and victims groups. Um, our coalitions against the domestic violence joined in on these too because so many of their clients are criminalized because they have been through severe trauma and maybe um, started using substances or other or other things have happened. So within those uh, convenings, we went, went around the state and I thought that it would be, we would hear different things from people in different areas. You know, maybe we would hear different things in our um, bigger cities than maybe, you know, in our rural area. And what we really heard was, and I don't know how it is in Canada, mm -hmm. but this issue of housing, how right. many people were unhoused or lived in a threat with a threat of being unhoused, um, how expensive it was to get housing. Um, that was one of our, our big things we heard. We also heard the lack of prevention, resources, education for our youth. Um, I remember there was this great individual that we met who had talked about the war on drugs and, you know, the casualties that it's left, whether that be folks who've died from overdose deaths, folks who are doing long prison terms, folks who maybe are still struggling and how that will affect generations to come and how we do absolutely nothing, little to nothing to deal with that trauma and how much more it would make sense to do that when someone is young, but yet our priorities aren't there. Um, so I think these issues, even though, you know, I would love to, and I know you too, it, it would be great if we like had a simple, simplified solution. Um, but I think it, you know, to really deal with some of the things that are happening in our society, like we have to do it at this multifaceted approach. Um, 
you know, we have to figure out how to meet folks' basic needs. We have to figure out, um, you know, to have access for folks to address trauma when it happens, like even when for younger folks, um, we don't need to like push that off. So yeah, hopefully that answered your question. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It did. As you said, it's so multifaceted and complicated. Um, I, I'm curious maybe to go back to your own story when you were younger and your mom was really suffering and doing all the things she was doing. Did you ever have access to any services? Absolutely not. No. I remember um, in the second grade, I went into, you know, my classroom and my teacher had the newspaper, you know, on her desk. And my mother was on the front of the newspaper because we're a small town. Everything yeah. that happens is scandalous. And, um, and I remember just being like so embarrassed and angry and, you know, I ended up, I was so just a mix of emotions, which a little eight year old couldn't even start to no sort doubt. out. Yeah. Um, but I remember feeling so overwhelmed that I wouldn't raise my hand to go to the bathroom. Wow. You know, it was just so much. And, yeah. and never. Did you pee your pants? I did. Yeah, 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 for sure. For sure. And it was, yeah. um, you know, just, and never, you know, all the teachers, the faculty knew about what was going on, but no. Never was there, hey, maybe you should see a counselor or here's this help. Um, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And as you said, that sort of what uh, those personal stories are so helpful to, I guess, provide insight into the other things you're saying about when kids are facing traumatic situations or when they're suffering, when we can meet them where they're at to the best of our ability that generally leads to positive outcomes and it's complicated to figure out how to do that oh it's um i have so many thoughts and questions i, I don't know which one to to settle on here i think how did you sober up or how did you recover and how did you so i think you said around your mid 20s, I think, yeah. was when it started to happen. So, from this little, you know, eight year old girl to your recovery process, you've told us some things about that. But what was sort of the intervention or the the moment where the clouds parted, or you know, you know what I mean? It's so everyone's journey is different. But what was that like for you? And can you detail how you got through that initial part and what you do now? Yeah, yeah. Um, so in my mid twenties, I, uh, I mentioned earlier, but I went to prison and um, I actually got two five year sentences, um, for drug trafficking. One of them was for one prescription pill. Um, what they, what they did in my town is they paid folks who suffered from a substance use disorder to be confidential informants. Oh my um, God. So it was a friend from that I went to school with, known my whole life, had actually lived with me at one point when he had nowhere else to stay. Um, so, yeah, so I got a five-year sentence for that, and then I got a five-year sentence um, of complicity. And like I said, this is someone that I had used with, I had lived with, you know, it was, uh, and it's really interesting. And I try not to be resentful because it just isn't, it just isn't good for me. <laughs> I don't yeah, think no it, doubt, no doubt. <laughs> but, you know, often I think, oh, my gosh, like I got two, you know, I got a five-year sentence for one pill and the Sacklers never saw a day. It's sickening. No, it is so, yeah, it's so hard not to get caught up in that resentment and that sort of, oh, yeah, yeah it's madness. It's total madness. Um, okay, so so you had those two five year sentences. Yeah. And, so yeah. so I, yeah, I went to a, I went to prison. I thought, okay, maybe in here I'm going to finally like, get some kind of treatment. I'm going to be able to get in a program. I'm going to be able to figure out how to stop. So when I got in there, I signed up for any kind of and every kind of program that they had. 
Unfortunately, the whole time I was there, I didn't get into drug treatment. The waiting list was so long. Oh, my God. For the prisoners. Yep. Unbelievable. Okay. Yep. So eventually I did. Luckily in Kentucky, you know, we're, we are a state where, you know, you can go up for parole uh, and, you know, do some of your sentence in the community. So after um, 13 months, I was able to go up for parole and was granted parole. So I ended up going to a halfway house. So that's just a facility after prison. Usually uh, there's some kind of correctional staff working there. Um, So there were parole officers on site. But at this halfway house, there was a recovery program was part of it. And I really, you know, honestly, finally... (laughs) I'd, I'd found one. Um, so. Right, right. And can I ask you, did you have to detox on your own in prison? Yeah, Holy absolutely. Smokes. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I, and I was detoxing. I had an abscess because I was an intravenous drug user. And uh-huh. um, I had laid there, you know, I, I mean, I had this red streak going up my whole entire arm. I thought I was going to lose my arm and, and the um, staff at the prison would not give me medical care. Finally, it got so bad because I was getting fevers. I was so sick um, that I was finally able to go to the hospital. And I remember I went to the hospital in chains, handcuffs and shackles and an orange jumpsuit. And the way that the doctors and nurse nurses treated me was horrible. Um, they didn't even, you know, the, the place got lanced, so cut up them with a scalpel. And, you know, they had tried to numb it, and I kept saying, it isn't numb. It isn't numb. Right. And they just cut it open. Jesus <sighs> Christ. Anyway, yeah, so D- Yeah, I- no, but you're a fucking hero. Just, <laughs> I mean, to, to anybody who kind of has to go through that, it's just like, oh, my God. And to come out the other side. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for telling. And so then whatever they patched it up, you went back to prison and just were left to somehow survive through that whole detoxing process. Yeah. 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 And wow. to take care of this wound, which, right. you know, I'm not in a clean environment. I was scared every day that I would get a staph infection. Yeah. And luckily, um, you know, it was actually the women at the jail that helped me, you know? Um, yeah. Yeah. So... I, wow, I okay, so the, you're in the halfway house. Yeah. So I'm yeah. so I'm at this halfway house and there's a recovery program. Um, so that's where, you know, I started recovery. Like it was hard at first. Um I relapsed early on. Um, but then that second time, you know, uh it was just the women that were in that program, we had peer mentors, so folks who had completed it, and it was women just like me. A majority of them were formerly incarcerated. You know, they had a lot of similarities that I had. A lot of them had been through, like, severe trauma because, unfortunately, um, in my teenage years, I was also sexually assaulted. So a lot of those women, like, had those, you know, so many similarities and seeing that they, you know, were in recovery and that it was, you know, gave me this hope like that I could possibly be too. Um, so they, so they really saved my life. Um, and, and after that, I decided to remain in the city where I had went to the halfway house at because now I'd built a support system which truly at that time, if I would have came back home, I would I couldn't have found a job anywhere. I wasn't even allowed in the gas stations in my county. <laughs> like I wasn't allowed. <laughs> I was like banished. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it was real. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's nice to be able to laugh about that. I yeah. Think. yeah. Yeah. Totally. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. You got okay. to. Like, oh yeah, you do. You do. <laughs> um, okay. 
So I ended up staying in that city. Um, reentry was really hard because it isn't like landlords, you know, are are looking to rent apartments or houses to folks with drug trafficking charges. Right. Um. So that was really hard. Finally, found a place to live. Um. Unfortunately, too, it's it's, you know, that's a population that can be exploited and no one cares. Um. So like my rent was outrageous my my room was about the size of a closet it was it was about the size of my jail cell um but i but at least i had a place to stay and i had to have one because on parole if you don't have a place to stay you go back to prison so at least i had a place to stay i started working various jobs again that was that was hard because of my background so i I worked three jobs at once wow i mean it's it's unbelievable and i just to put put some words to were you still connected to your recovery program and to the yes. support systems like I mean how did you get through that I know everyone's story is different of course and mine mine is certainly different but without sort of AA and my sponsor and luckily in Canada it, there's long wait lists at least in Ontario but you can get government covered psychotherapy so I had all of that. And I was certainly not in a situation like yours. How, what was your sort of routine and how did you deal with all that stress? Yeah. I mean, it was my support system, my support group, the women that I had went through that recovery program with, um, other folks that I had met in 12 step programs. Uh Um, so they just, you know, were there for yeah, me because sure. cuz constantly Do, I lived in the threat of going back to prison. Yeah, for not right, doing right. not committing a new crime, but just for not, you know, having a place to live or right. not having a job, you have to have a job um mm-hmm. or getting in trouble for, you know, I remember, you know, I'm from Kentucky, so uh-huh. you probably heard of the Kentucky Derby. Yes. Um, <laughs> so I because one of my jobs was a catering job. I, I worked a catering job. I cleaned houses. And then I worked um, part-time as a receptionist at a counseling center. The guy there was in recovery and gave opportunities to people in recovery. So that's how I got that job. But for this catering gig, you know, the Kentucky Derby was happening. And you can make a lot of money to cater, you know, to... Um, bartend anything at the Kentucky Derby um, Mm -hmm. and tips. So that's what I did. I worked at the Kentucky Derby. uh, There was a a part of the evening that I did have to serve drinks. I wasn't a bartender, um, but I had to serve them uh, to folks there. And I almost got violated on parole and sent back to prison. That was the closest I came to going mm-hmm. back, but I almost got sent back due to that job. Really? Because you were in proximity to alcohol? Yep. Wow. Wow. Yeah. So oh, um, oh. <laughs> that's my only experience with the Kentucky Derby. Okay. I've never been as a spectator. <laughs> that's the only. Um, and can you tell where you... Um, did you go through the steps and did you have a sponsor or did you sort of have any prayer or meditation or sort of spiritual practices or what were kind of your most helpful tools? Yeah. Yeah, I did. Um, I did go through the steps and had a sponsor at the time. She was amazing. She, um, I mentioned one of my jobs was house cleaning. That was actually yeah. her business. So wow. she let me work wow. nice. Nice. <laughs> I work for her. <laughs> so, yeah, it was constant. Um, I, I prayed constantly. That was definitely one of, you know, because I, like I mentioned, it was such a time of fear. Oh, my um, God. Yeah, I can't imagine. Yeah. So I had to constantly pray, lean on, on that support group. You know, my sponsor was... Um, vital like she was so important and you know at the time I couldn't because I was on parole I couldn't leave um the city that I was in to go home for you know holidays and things of that nature 
and it was always, you know, I'd miss so many from being incarcerated and, and it, it was even harder to be out and not be able to go. It was just, it broke my heart and my sponsor, you know, like I always on holidays, she would swoop me up and, and I would go with her and be with her family. Um, so yeah, I would have never, I, I wholeheartedly believe that I would have never made it without those people that God put in my path, you know? Like yeah, I, yeah, yeah. It's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, let's take a moment to uh, pay homage to our sponsors and all the people that have come before us to help us get here. It's uh, it's amazing. Um, yeah. yeah. And can you maybe actually, yeah, so so you're doing these jobs, you're still on parole. How did the parole finish and how did you kind of get into this work now that you're yeah. into? Yeah. Yeah. So finally, I served out on my parole. <laughs> <You know>? uh, <laughs> and how long was it? Like, how do you, how does that end? I was out on it like a, a couple of more years. I was able to get some um, time taken off for, um, you know, good time credit for not getting in trouble for working. Um, so, yeah, that was over. That was probably one of the best days of my life for real. I bet. Um, <laughs> but I, I started go. I went back to college. And, um, you know, like I said earlier, I couldn't do it before. Um, I went to college for social work. So, And how old were you at this at this point? <clears throat> 26, maybe 26, okay. 27. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I would go at night. I would work those three different jobs, whatever I was doing. That was a wild time. And then and then there was a job opening at the the halfway house that I used to be at that had the recovery center. Um, so I applied for it and I got that job. Um, I ended up going on to be the program director of that facility, which within the recovery program was the biggest recovery program for women in the state of Kentucky at the time. Wow. Um, I was a, a I was the first woman with a felony conviction to hold that position um, wow. because I also worked with the Department of Corrections. You know, I worked with a lot of women that were coming from jail and prison, um, and I loved it. And at the same time, it was the hardest job I ever had because it was absolutely heartbreaking when I lost um, clients and I remember telling them, like, if you do good, like if you do what you're supposed to do, you know, you'll get out of here. You can have a better life. You can get a job. You can get, you know, employment. You can get your kids back. And, you know, I had clients from all across the state. And often that wouldn't happen. Often I couldn't find them anywhere to live. Often right. wow. they, could, they couldn't get their kids back. Um and there came a point, like, really, that I felt like I was, like, lying to them, almost it. Um, so that's how I ended up getting in the policy and some other, you know, there was a God moment in there, too. Um, uh -huh. But I ended up uh, going to work at a policy organization in Kentucky, had no clue what I was doing. I just knew that I had to swim up upstream. You know, I yeah. had to try to work to fix these issues. Right. Or these people that I loved and cared about so much, if those aren't fixed, then we can't, you know, these important areas of their life can't change because of these laws and regulations that prevent it. So I went to work at that policy org, no experience. I couldn't even vote because I had a felony. Um, but learn, you know, I, I just leaned on folks that had done the work for a long time, leaned on a lot of attorneys that were willing to mentor me and take me under their wing, um, founded a group of directly impacted Kentuckians, about mm, 80% of them are in recovery. And we worked on recovery legislation. We worked on criminal justice legislation. Um, and we worked with a lot of unlikely allies, folks that, you know, we were willing to work with anybody. Like if you were willing to to come and work with us to do good and the 
the first year we got nothing done. We passed zero bills. Um, by the time that I left there, you know, I was there for about four years. We had over a dozen. Wow. Um, yeah. Who were, can you, who were some of the unlikely allies? Um, I mean, like the Kentucky Chamber of Commerce. Okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. All of our, our victims groups, like I mentioned earlier, uh-huh. conser- conservative groups. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was just youth advocacy groups. Mm-hmm. I mean, we, yeah, we try to build this huge coalition, like where everybody, yeah. because incarceration Amazing. and substance use touches us all. Indeed, indeed. And I think different ideologies, whatever you want to call it, have different ways of acknowledging that and contributing to it, I think. Yeah. And finding ways to bring or broaden that circle is amazing. I guess that's, I would, that answers the question. In some sense, I was going to ask you what that common thread is or what was the part that brought everybody together or how did all those stakeholders agree to work together? Because I assume there was um, opposing viewpoints and all those kind of things. How did that all happen? Oh, yeah. There was a lot of opposing viewpoints. But <laughs> like you said earlier, I think I think you articulated it pretty well. Like folks had different interests in uh-huh. um, the subject, but really like showing them that you do have an interest in this. You know, like when it comes to businesses, you know, so much of our unemployment rate is folks who, you know, have suffered from incarceration, from substance use disorder. Um, That's why our workforce isn't as strong. And how do we make sure to uplift those folks, like to help those folks? Um, The youth advocacy groups, you know, youth overdose deaths are rising, youth youth incarceration. These kids' parents are incarcerated. Um, So they joined, you know, the victims groups, like I mentioned, Unfortunately, so many of the folks in those shelters had also had experience with the criminal justice system and or substance use disorder. So it was really, you know, we had a lot of faith groups, you know, um, and really relay like this is an issue of faith. Um, So, yeah, it was just if you're willing to work with, you know, and let's come together when we come together. We'll yeah. fight over other things when we can't, yeah. <laughs> but if we can come together, you know, we can, we can get stuff done. Right. And, wow. And yeah, and it works. So I was doing that and that was great. And then this position at dream.org open and it was a national position. And, um, I decided, you know, I wanted to take a chance on that. Um, so I've been working here for a couple of years. It's really, it's been an amazing experience. Uh, we work with individuals in different states um, and help them learn how to advocate. We help them fight for policy changes that they want in their state. Uh, and we really like support them and build that infrastructure. So even when we're gone, they can continue. Right. Um, wow. so yeah, we, we worked in nine states this year, two bills are still moving through the process to become law, but in five states, new laws have passed and it's wow. been, yeah, these folks with this direct experience, like reaching back, like saying, like, I want to make this change for the better and they're doing yeah. it. That's amazing. What what are what are some of those bills? What are the changes that are happening? Yeah. So in Kentucky, um, the group there because we work here, you know, it's my yeah. home state. Uh, but yeah. <laughs> they fought to decriminalize fentanyl testing strips. Um, okay. Unfortunately, here in Kentucky, that was a misdemeanor, which could have actually been a felony. Um, wow. And sorry. So that's for if someone wants to use to test the drugs they're using. Yeah. Just to okay. have the strips at all. Right. Wow. The strips were drug paraphernalia. Wow. They were against the law. Okay. Um, so even though, you know, we're one of the states with the highest 
number of fatal overdoses. But right. so they fought really hard to pass that. So that passed into law. Mm-hmm. Um, out in Washington, our empathy leader worked on a juvenile justice bill. He was um, experienced incarceration as a youth. And um, he, you know, that bill passed into law. And that will affect, um, you know, youth and, and folks sentenced as a, in their adulthood for years to come. Um, oh, in, in Arkansas, we uh, worked on, and our empathy leaders worked on fines and fees. Unfortunately, when you leave prison, um, you have to pay all these fines and fees. Like, you have to pay to be on probation. Um, (laughs) sometimes sometimes you owe jail fees because like Uh in kentucky you have to pay to be in jail so god and if you don't pay these you go back yeah so man i know it's a wild situation so uh, situation that's a good way to put it (laughs) yeah the the folks there fought really hard to uh, to get a bill passed to give a, a grace period. Eventually, they want to obviously get rid of them. It's just a right. hard political environment. But even that grace period is a huge deal. A few months right to be on. able to get on your feet. Right. Um, so, yeah. So they have, I mean, it's just, it, and it's amazing, like, how they use some of these, their worst experiences, but draw off of those to say, this is how it could be better for me. And mm-hmm. even though it wasn't for me, let's fight to change it for people in the future. Yeah. Just that's beautiful. Awesome. beautiful. It is beautiful. Yeah. Um, one question I'm curious about, I kind of asked you a bit earlier, but not as specifically. I saw, of course, as often is the case, I saw some headline. I didn't read the article, of course, but it was basically, it's in Canada, a woman, a woman whose son... I think overdosed. I don't know if he died, but it, it was sort of arguing for this kind of compassionate approach to people that are really unwell and sick, where it's like our operating procedure now is just to let them be homeless and let them be drug addicts and give them, you know, that sort of harm reduction idea. Although at the same time, that in my opinion, that's not actually helping them. So I, I just kind of curious if you have thoughts on how we might help people in those situations or if you've ever seen approaches that have been helpful and certainly incarcerating them is probably not the right thing to do, although we don't seem to have a better approach yet. And then, yeah, maybe I'll just, I'll ask you one question at a time. <laughs> so let me just start with that one. Yeah. Um, I know in you know, some states here, mm-hmm. um, you know, folks will um, be offered different treatment options. Also, there's some like peer support models that are coming, like to have uh-huh. this like kind of peer that's a like, case manager right. um, to like help you with resources, um, walk with you, which I think has a potential and we're seeing is very um, successful. Mm -hmm. So I think definitely like those things would be, those models would be super helpful. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you did mention earlier sort of the idea of housing and and services and that kind of stuff. There's a host of challenges with that too, but that is certainly a piece of the puzzle. And I guess, any, I think we covered a lot of, you, you sort of talk, spoke about it through your own experience, but maybe because obviously, well, not obviously, the vast majority of people that are incarcerated are men. And mm-hmm. so women's issues, it's almost as if women's incarceration isn't even really acknowledged as a societal thing in some sense. Uh, But you, you sort of have insights into the barriers that women face for re-entry and, and all the issues in the, in the prison system for women. And maybe 
Can you just talk about some of the things you're seeing change or what you think would be effective for change? Yeah. Um, and like you said, it's a vast majority of men that are incarcerated, but women's incarceration rates are the, mm-hmm. are the fastest growing. Wow. Um, yeah. So unfortunately when I was incarcerated, it was common practice and it still is in a lot of the States in the United States. Mm-hmm. Um, but to use handcuffs, shackles on women, um, during pregnancy, um, that really in cases it's not required, you know, right. it isn't even while giving birth. Um, Jesus Christ. Which, Are you serious? I'm serious. Holy fuck. I know, which Excuse I'm like, my if, language, a wo- yeah, it's like if a woman is going to escape while giving birth, like literally in the act of it, let her go. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a miracle. Let her go. Um, so things like that, like we need wow. to, wow. we need to fix that in yeah. um, all of our states. Also, we see high rates, unfortunately, of sexual abuse for women yeah. that are incarcerated. Yeah. Um, you from know, other pr- prisoners or by staff. Yeah. Correctional yeah, officers. Yeah. Oh, um, so and they're, evil. Yeah. yeah, they're, they're starting to be more prosecutions, but, uh-huh. um, I remember when I was prison in prison, there was a, a guard, a correctional officer. It was over a dozen counts and he ended up with probation. And I remember wow. we all sat in the day room. We were all incarcerated for long, had long s- sentences for drug crimes. And he never saw a day. Um, so there has to be more safeguards, protections. Um, there needs to be more trauma-informed care, mental health for women. Um, folks that are incarcerated, and that's men and women, um, have higher uh, rates of uh, physical violence, sexual violence in their in their past. Um, so there has to be more resources uh, and to understand that this is, you know, a population even more so than the general public that mm-hmm. would need those services. Um, I definitely think for uh kids you know women that have kids that have to go through parental incarceration that there needs to be resources for those families you know that's that's hard um you know even at you know when you reintegrate into society you know there isn't a lot of help there even when you even when you get your kids back you know help for them or for you because often when you're incarcerated and have kids or family members you will disassociate you have to kind of to survive yeah Um, so there needs to be uh more help there um this is like in the weeds but a serious issue um feminine hygiene products um they there's some jails and prisons um, where you just don't get those or you get so little that it's not enough. Um, wow. Yeah. The way that we feed pregnant women while incarcerated. Yeah. Right. There's just a lot of, a lot of, uh, women's issues that, and you know, like you said, there's so many men incarcerated that jails and prisons that we have now were designed for men. Right. Right. You know, and so many of the yeah. policies, yeah. so these right. nuances and details are left out yeah. right. and then women don't get their needs met. Wow. I guess maybe it's a good place to sort of wind down one. Thank you. What an amazing, it's always amazing to hear people like yourself who've gone through what you've gone through and to be where you are now. Any maybe any sort of thoughts on what you hope and wish and dream for, or what you're kind of aiming at in your near future or any kind of things that you haven't said that you think are important to share? Yeah. I mean, I just hope that we um, increase access to mental health resources, to substance 
use disorder resources to harm reduction, um, especially in the States and um, stop just thinking that only incarceration is, is the way to go about it. Uh, Yeah. That we have more options. (laughs) Wow. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you again, Amanda. Thank you so much. Yeah. I hope we, there's other things I would have loved to ask and maybe next time we can get the cameras to work properly and, uh, yeah, it would be lovely to, to catch up with you sometime down the road. Yeah, of course, for sure. All right. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you so much, and I hope you have a great day. Thank and keep you. up the great work. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thanks. Take care. Bye. I am very grateful that you watched to the end of this video. Please click one of the boxes to watch more of our content, and otherwise, have a great day. Peace out.